Ignatius Donnelly was born in 1831 to an Irish immigrant who had settled in Philadelphia. He was an American congressman, but he was best remembered for authoring a book published in 1882 called Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, where he detailed theories concerning the mythical lost continent of Atlantis, which according to Plato, was an empire that flourished during the late Pleistocene, or Ice Age, and met its demise through volcanic cataclysm and sea level rise from rapidly melting glaciers, which submerged the island kingdom somewhere in the Atlantic, probably around the Azores archipelago. Donnelly suggested that Atlantis had been destroyed during the same event remembered in the Bible as the Great Flood. He cited research on the ancient Maya civilization, claiming that it shared a common origin of ancient civilizations in Egypt, Europe, and the Americas. He also thought that it had been the original home of an Aryan race whose blue-eyed descendants could be scattered around the world, giving rise to these new empires after re-establishing and disseminating agriculture during the Holocene. While many of Donnelly's theories have been discredited since the 1800s, given the advances in archaeology, geology, and genetics, some of his conclusions regarding the diffusion of race have proven to be intuitively correct, in particular when referencing mythology and biblical history. For example, Ignatius Donnelly wrote, quote, Did the Aryan race come from Atlantis? The center of the Aryan migrations within the historical period was Armenia. Here too is Mount Ararat, where it is said that the Ark rested, another identification with the flood regions, as it represents the usual transfer of the Atlantis legend by an Atlantean people to a high mountain in their new home. Now turn to a map. Suppose the ships of Atlantis to have reached the shores of Syria at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. The Atlantis ships are then but 200 miles distant from Armenia. But these ships need not stop at Syria. They can go by the Dardanelles and the Black Sea by uninterrupted water communication to the shores of Armenia itself. If we admit, then, that it was from Armenia that Aryan stocked Europe and India, there is no reason why the original population of Armenia should not have been themselves colonists from Atlantis. The Greeks, who are Aryans, traced their descent from the people who were destroyed by the flood, as did other races clearly Aryan. The nations who are comprehended under the common appellation of Indo-European, says Max Mueller, the Hindus, the Persians, the Celts, Germans, Romans, Greeks, and Slavs, do not only share the same words and the same grammar, slightly modified in each country, but they seem to have likewise preserved a mass of popular traditions which had grown up before they left their common home. Their domesticated animals were the same as our own, except for one fowl adopted from America. In the past 10,000 years, we've added one bird to their list of domesticated animals. They raised wheat and wool, and spun and wove as we do. Their metals are ours, even iron they had already discovered. A still further evidence of the civilization of this ancient race is found in the fact that before the dispersion from their original home, the Aryans had reached such a degree of development that they possessed a regularly organized religion. All this presupposes temples, priests, sacrifices, and an orderly state of society. But above all, it must be remembered that the Greeks, an Aryan race, in their mythological traditions, showed the closest relationship to Atlantis. We find in the Eleusinian Mysteries an Atlantean institution, their influence during the whole period of Greek history, down to the coming of Christianity, was extraordinary. And even then, this masonry of pre-Christian days, in which kings and emperors begged to be initiated, was, it is claimed, continued to our own times in our own Freemasons, who trace their descent back to the Dionysiac fraternity which originated in Attica. 
And just as we have seen the Saturnalian festivities of Italy descending from Atlantean harvest feast, so these Illusunian mysteries can be traced back to Plato's island. But as the story goes, this all came to a catastrophic end at the close of the Pleistocene. According to Plato, quote, you remember only one deluge, though there have been many. You and your fellow citizens are descended from the few survivors that remained, but you know nothing about it because so many succeeding generations left no record in writing. The change in the rising and setting of the sun and other heavenly bodies, how in those times they used to set in the quarter where they now rise and used to rise where they now set. Of all changes which take place in the heavens, this reversal is the greatest and most complete. There is at that time great destruction of animals in general, and only a small part of the human race survives. According to Rudolf Steiner, quote, the greatest part of the Atlantean population declined and from a small portion are descended the so-called Aryans who comprise present-day civilized humanity. In his 1896 book called The Swastika, the earliest known symbol and its migrations, Thomas Wilson, curator of the Department of Prehistoric Anthropology in the U.S. National Museum, wrote, quote, An Aryan symbol used by the Aryan peoples before their dispersion through Asia and Europe. This is a fair subject for inquiry and might serve as an explanation how, as a sacred symbol, the swastika might have been carried to the different people and countries in which we now find it by the splitting up of the Aryan peoples and their migrations and establishment in the various parts of Europe. In a book first published in 1887 called Bailey Britain, History and Genealogy, it says, quote, the descendants of Shem are believed to be that ancient Aryan race which inhabited Central Asia east of the Caspian Sea and north of the Hindu Kush mountains, perhaps what is now Turkestan. They are also called Indo-Europeans and Indo-Germanic race. Conflating Germanic, Indo-European, or Aryan people with the offspring of Shem might sound contradictory at first since Shem, or Sem, is a son of Noah from where we get the term Semite from. Anthropologically speaking, Semitic is a language group, and while politically distinct, it's still considered part of the same Caucasian demographic, a term that comes from the Caucasus Mountains, where Mount Ararat is located. Noah was said to have three sons, Japheth, Shem, and Ham representing the three continents that the descendants of Noah allegedly possessed after the flood. The word possessed implies that Noah's Caucasian offspring diffused agricultural civilization and governed over these three regions, which are represented by three different colors in this map, illustrating the world as peopled by the descendants of Noah who was not a Jew, Muslim, or Christian, but ancestor of all three stemming from the same Caucasian race. In the Bunting Clover Map, drawn by a German pastor in 1581 and published in the Travel Book of Holy Scripture, we see again the world portrayed as a clover leaf divided into three by color, representing the three offspring of Noah, with Jerusalem in the center of the map surrounded by the three continents. The fact that Jerusalem is the focal point in the center speaks to its strategic location, giving access to Europe, Africa, and Asia, which was not only exploited by the ancient Caucasians or Aryans of the Holocene, but according to this map, 
illustrating the genetic marker of haplogroup X, which is primarily seen in demographics that share genetic affinities with Caucasians during antediluvian times when Atlantis allegedly existed, is most pronounced in the territory that was once known as Phoenicia and today is called Israel, where Jerusalem is located, as well as Anatolia or Turkey, where Mount Ararat is located in the Caucasus Mountains. In this context, Zionism and the symbolic rebuilding of the Third Temple in Jerusalem represents the re-establishment of an ancient colony that once ruled over the world, governed by a Caucasian population that seems to be in a state of collective amnesia about its fabled Atlantean Aryan origins. Of course, 9 out of 10 Zionists today are not Jewish, and a millennia ago, the attempt to reconquer Jerusalem during the Crusades was initiated by the Knights Templar, who were outwardly a military order of the Catholic faith. That said, the Templars held esoteric beliefs that they descended from the temple priests of Jerusalem, and their ancestors entered Europe as waves of lost tribes after the sacking of the temple for which they are named after. Rex Deus, which means God Kings in Latin, are a group of European aristocratic families that claim ancestry from the bloodlines of the priests of Jerusalem. Rex Deus are a bloodline that trace their origins back to the 24 high priests of the Temple of Jerusalem, which includes the family of Jesus. And according to Holy Mother of the Church, and who are we to doubt their word, Jesus was single and had no children. But in actual fact, like all Jews of his time, he was obliged by Jewish custom and tradition to marry and procreate. He was doubly in, uh, empowered to do this because he was also a rabbi and the heir to the throne of the line of David. So he had to produce an heir. And one of the most closely guarded secrets in European history is the fact that he founded a bloodline known as the Desposini, which are still extant in Europe today. When I go to England, I stay with one member of it, and when I go to Nice, I have breakfast with another. And descendants of Jesus are all around you, and many of the people who are the true descendants of the Jesus of Nazareth don't even know it. Well, I've just used a term which is inaccurate, Jesus of Nazareth. The problem is that Nazareth didn't exist at the time of Jesus. He was Jesus the Nazarene. He was a member of an esoteric cult attached to the Essene order, an initiatory form of spirituality which is still being practiced in secret today. And the Rex Deus families outwardly practice the religion of their place and time, but secretly amongst themselves follow their own path. They trace the influence of these families on the development of European culture, and that influence was quite profound particularly in spiritual matters. They were the families responsible for the founding of the military order of the Knights Templar. And after that was suppressed, several centuries later, they played a seminal role in the foundation of the worldwide fraternity of Freemasonry, which is still running and still extant today. So their influence is all pervasive. They were still practicing a form of initiatory Judaism which traced its roots back long before the time of Jesus and its original origins come from Egypt. <laughs> that story deserves to be told. And it's a story which is riveting because these people acquired power in Europe very, very early on at the time of Charlemagne and are still in positions of power today. And there is a, a chivalric order, which is still running, called the Order of the Fleur de Lis. Membership is by invitation, but to hold office within that order, you have to be a member of one of the families of the Rex Deus group. And they cover some very, very powerful people. What their agenda is today, I haven't the faintest idea. But they're still about, and they're still exerting massive influence behind the scenes, all very quietly. And I, for one, would love to know what their agenda is. 
winning is, is tough. I always said winning is somewhat maybe innate. Maybe it's just something you have. You know, you have the winning gene. My father is German, right? Was German. My uncle was a great professor and scientist and engineer, Dr. John Trump at MIT. Good, good genes, very good genes, okay? One of the smartest people in the history of MIT in my blood. If you believe in genes, some do, some don't. Believe me, if it's good genes, we believe in genes, right? We're allowed to say this. A lot of it's about the genes, isn't it? Don't you believe? Do we believe in the gene thing? I mean, I do, right? You know, I do. When you have 111 wins, that's in your blood, right? It's got to be in the blood. It's good genes. You have good genes. Good genes. You believe in genes? <laughs> He's got good genes. <laughs> These are great women, great men. Uh, frankly, great genes. You have great genes. You have very good genes. Just remember the president. You have great genes. Those genes. Those two young men have the greatest genes anyone's ever had. The best genes I've ever seen. A man named Henry Ford, good bloodlines, good bloodlines. If you believe in that stuff, you got good blood. <laughs> we have good stuff. We have great genes in this room. We have smart people. A man with really fantastic genes. <laughs> Gotta have like the best genes in the world. Although you had an ex-governor here that had very good genes too. We have his son in the audience, too. You have good genes, you know that, right? <laughs> you have good genes. Good genes, you have good genes. It's in the genes, it's in the blood, right? It's in the blood. Would you like to, to have a 3,000-year bloodline? For the I Trumps? think it would be great. I don't know what I'd be doing for the rest of the time, <laughs> but I think it would be great. You know, I'm proud to have that German blood. There's no question about it. Great stuff. Not only do the royal families of Europe come from the same bloodline, many world leaders such as Donald Trump, share genetic affinities with the ancestors of the Knights Templar that, according to esoteric Germanic societies, like the Thule and Vril Society, not to mention the Rosicrucians and Freemasons, all trace their lineage back before the advent of the Abrahamic faiths, all the way to the Aryan Magi of Mesopotamia, and before that to the pre-biblical time of Atlantis. That said, the legendary antediluvian empires were not homogenous, and the ancient struggle for global supremacy is still being played out today, with one demographic represented by a nationalist sect that wants to maintain its genetic and cultural identity, and another sect that wants to replace the traditional power structures based on noble bloodlines with a mixed, borderless, population of secular, atheist, genderless, Marxist ideology under the thumb of a global Bolshevik communist dictatorship. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.